All right, Hal, uh, let's go ahead and let's kick this off. Everybody, I wanna say thank you very much for attending today. This is a really cool webcast. We have someone, honestly, that has been a mentor for me for a really long time. I would say, Hal, I taught for 15 years and I would say you were very easily there all 15 years. And um, there's, there's just, there's a small number of people that I get super excited about anytime I get to hang out with them at the SANS Institute. It doesn't mean I don't like other people, but Hal was easily the most intimidating person at, at SANS uh, for me because the dude's like very tall and um, he's got this booming voice that you're going to hear in a second and he's brilliant. And uh, I, I look at him very much as that mean big brother uh, that's always doing his best to teach me a lesson and make me better. And I'm really excited and honored that he's here to teach us all lessons and make us better at Linux and Unix. So with that, Hal, I'm gonna hand it over to you, sir. Please take it away. Wow, huh, mean big brother. Hmm, okay. Um, wow, hey, so here I am. And um, actually I uh, wanted to thank the, the Black Hills folks for putting this one together. I, uh, you know, as I was mentioning on, on the pre-show banter, I, I've become, I don't know, I guess a little bit concerned. When I started in IT a uh, long, long, long time ago, you know, I, I went to work in the industry and there were a lot of big IT shops running Unix and I got to go work for, you know, a, a, a site where we had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Unix machines. And we had a whole staff of Unix admins and, and I was you know the junior person on the totem pole. And I got a lot of mentorship from the people I worked with and I, I learned a ton just at that first job. But, but nowadays that's not really the pattern, right? I mean, we've got, if, if there's IT, it's you're, you know, you may be an army of one, you're kind of doing a lot of self-teaching and it, it ends up that, you know, that you end up with big gaps in your knowledge, right? So I've been on this kind of crusade to, to get out some of the stuff that was imparted to me by, by more senior admins. You know, for a while there, uh, Tim Medine and Ed Scotus and I were having a lot of fun writing the command line Kung Fu blog. And, you know, that was great until we ran out of ideas, but there's still, you know, years worth of content at that website. And, you know, the conceit for Command Line Kung Fu was we'd, we'd set ourselves a challenge and Tim would solve it with PowerShell and Ed would do command.exe and I'd do Linux, which meant that, you know, I spent an hour working on each episode and Tim spent like four hours working on each episode and Ed would spend all day. And, you know, that was great. So, but there's, you know, if you're somebody who jumps between platforms, it's a great way to, to spruce up your knowledge across the, the different platforms. By the way, the, you can see the URL here for the, the slides for this presentation. You're welcome to, to grab the slides and, and play along at home. There was also a question earlier about the Linux distro that I'm gonna be using for the examples, and I'm using a CentOS machine, you know, but I, I, I'm trying to play it right down the middle of the fairway here. So the, the stuff that I'm doing should work on certainly any Linux distro and probably on most Unix-like operating systems. It's all sort of rock and roll to me. So, you know, how, why, why Unix? Well, you know, for me, it started at a time when Unix was the only game in town, but still through the decades, I've continued to use Unix operating systems and I still use them professionally in my forensics practice, which I, I take some amount of, uh, of good natured uh, ribbing from my, my colleagues. It's like, how, you know, why are you using that open source tool chain instead of one of the, you know, more integrated commercial forensic suites? And then they get a white screen of death and, and I'm still being productive and I'm, I'm laughing. So, uh, and, and, you know, for me, it's a lot about productivity, right? The learning a command shell and, and honestly, like 
I don't really care whether it's you know the Linux you know Bash shell or whether it's PowerShell on Windows, but being able to automate tasks and being able to do ad hoc kinds of queries and reports is is a huge force multiplier for anybody in IT. So you know certainly learn to use the command shell of whatever platform you prefer. And, and in PowerShell is, you know, an entirely reasonable uh, shell for that. In fact, in a lot of ways, you know, PowerShell ha has more power than the uh, Unix shell. But the other reason for, for Unix like operating systems is just sheer ubiquity, right? Like, okay, Windows is the dominant desktop platform. There's no argument. You get no argument from me on that. And there's certainly a lot of Windows servers out there in the enterprise. But if you if you look globally, right, outside of that very large market share, everything else is a Unix-like operating system. And here I'm talking not just about Linux, but also about Mac OS, which I consider a Unix-like operating system since it's got a free BSD user space. Plus there's Android, right, probably the single largest market share of Linux on the planet. And now, of course, all of these wonderful embedded devices that are all over the places, which are mostly just, you know, little ARM processors running some, some Unix thing, whether it's powering your refrigerator or your automobile or the thermostat on your wall. And, and all of this stuff comes up in my investigations because it's all over the place, right? You know, you forensicate a DVR or, you know, whatever. And, and the Linux things are important, right? Their infrastructure, whether it's, you know, attacker infrastructure, which I've, I've gotten a chance to, to look at, or it's, you know, somebody's NoSQL database that's been trashed and, you know, being, you know, held, you know, for Bitcoin by some ransomware application. It, it's infrastructure and it's important and it's interesting, right? So, so go Unix. Okay, so uh, uh, that's the sales pitch, right? Let's start, you know, throwing some commands around, and and I'm gonna, you know, get off of the slides and actually just start doing this stuff live, right? Okay, so we're gonna start, we're gonna start light. We're just gonna like ease everybody into it, right? And then we're gonna ramp it up. So Unix, the Unix shell designed to be a text processing environment, right? It's it's fundamentally designed around processing textual output. And, you know, you can do very simple things. Like here, here's a simple string searching example, okay? So the setup here is that uh, the Deer Run website, as you'll, as you'll notice if you spend any time on it, aside from being ugly, is also just completely static HTML. I'm not using any kind of CMS or anything like that. And so it's amusing to me because I collect in my Apache logs all of the different, you know, WordPress attacks du jour or the Drupal attacks du jour or whatever, right? So I can see people just, you know, launching all of these different attacks uh, against my, my website. And so we're going to do a little bit of investigation in my web logs and try and, you know, pull out some information about who's doing nefarious stuff or trying to do nefarious stuff to my web server. Wow, that's like a that's like a double muting fail there, right? Because like you failed to mute your phone and you failed to mute your microphone. Just it just builds up. Just roll with it, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, here we go. I've got you know, some some of the logs from my web server. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna grep for people trying to, you know, try, you know, various bogus uh, URL exploits. A lot of them happen to contain the string plugins, right? It's a WordPress plugin or, or something like that, right? So we're just gonna look for the word plugins in my access log, okay? so. Very simple use of grep. We're just looking for a for a simple string like plugins from the access log. Hmm. Okay. Unix trivia question. I'll answer it at the end. Who knows where the command name grep 
comes from, you can put it into the chat and, and prove your your Unix dominance. Now, is this but, something they're going to be able just to like, like it's the Wikipedia and it's going to be done in two seconds, or is there like a little bit more depth to this one? No, I think that uh, you could probably Google this one and find the answer, but I'm just wondering who who knows this one off the top of their head. Anyway, so grep is grep is the string searching thing in in, in Unix, right? And here we're going to pull out all the lines from the access log that happen to match the word plugins. Okay. Cool. And here is you know the Apache log format and and really, I should say it's the NCSA HTTPD log format. And I want to find who is responsible for this log format and have a long conversation with them. Yeah. It, my hatred of this log format knows no bounds. And yet, you know, you, you have to deal with it constantly because it's the de facto standard uh, web log format. So you can see, you know, uh, in the first column, we've got the uh, requester, we've got the world's least useful time and date stamp right here in the middle of the line. You've got the method, you've got the URL that was requested in the protocol. Here's the response code. You'll notice these are all 404 not found because, hey, don't exist on my website. And the number of bytes returned, I've gone to the combined log format, which means I also have a refer field, as well as the user agent string, right? The dumpster fire that is modern browser user agent strings. Yay. Okay. So that's a lot of information and, and it's a lot of distraction, frankly. So I'd like to get rid of some of this junk and just focus in on the sources that are requesting these nasty URLs, okay? So really, I just want the first white space delimited column from the output format. Ooh, white space delimited fields. That means I get to use awk. Yes, awk. It's so, that language that everybody's afraid of. Okay. So Hal, before we're trying to answer questions as fast as we can, but I'm gonna I'm gonna let you finish, but I'm gonna interrupt you real quick. Okay, go. This is this is interesting because you asked the question about grep, and if it's a super easy question, like everyone hits the same answer again and again and again, and this one kind of floored me because uh, I'm gonna give you the answers that we received, okay, and then afterwards you tell me which one is correct. We have the GNU regular expression, generalized regular expression parser. It's the name of some three tools. The ed command, G-R-E-P, global regular expression print, stands for the original sets that were set to accomplish the task. Go retrieve exact phrase, global regular expression print, get regular expression print. Just, and I'm not gonna read the rest of them, but and and it was from the pop, Unix pioneer, John Grepp was the yeah. other one. No. It's, it's the ED command, it's global G, and then you put in the regular expression you wanna search for, that's the RE part, and then P means print out the matching lines. So back in the, in the day before we had even VI, you used a line editor like ED, and that's how you found the lines in your file that matched your pattern. So that's where so the commanding comes from. The one person that got it, or the first person that got it was Stefan, if you, sir, could please uh, type in your email address, we'll pick it up and we'll send you a cool prize. Well done, sir. Nice. Randy, right, sorry. why didn't you get that one? Okay. All right. So, so my mission is to pull out the first field, white space delimited field, from lines that match the keyword plugins. Now, look, I see people doing this kind of crap all the time and it drives me insane. Grep plugins, access log, pipe to awk, right? No, no, no. Okay, this is like one of my huge pet peeves. Look, awk has built in pattern matching, ladies and gentlemen. So I can search for lines that match plugins, and then I want to print out field number one. Easy peasy. Okay, there you go. Boom. All right, cool. So that's a little bit of awk. And, and by the way, if you download the slides, I've given you pointers in the slides to command line Kung Fu episodes and other resources where you can get more details about these commands 
that I'm throwing at you. Okay, great. So we're pulling out the sources that are sending these naughty URLs, but you know you can see there's some redundancy here. Okay, so I want to clean up the redundancy a little bit. All right, so I'm going to take the list of sources and I'm going to pipe it into another useful little idiom. I'm going to sort them, and this will just give me an alphabetic sort. I'm going to uniquify them. So I only get one copy of each unique value, but I'm gonna count the number of times each unique value occurs. You gotta sort them first because unique only works on, on duplicate lines that are right next to each other. And then I'm gonna sort the result numerically, like so. It's a beautiful thing, right? So you can see, exactly how many of these URLs were requested by each of the different sources. Okay, this is fundamentally the Unix design religion, right? You, you have all of these little primitive building blocks like Lego pieces, and you snap them together to quickly produce ad hoc tables and, and outputs like this. And this is absolutely one of my favorite little idioms, this sort unique dash C sort dash N. It's, I call it the command line histogram. And you can do all sorts of things with all sorts of data using this little idiom. Like, for example, it doesn't have to be Apache weblog data. It could be something like process information. So here, again, I'm printing out the first field with awk, and I'm piping it into the exact same idiom. And now I can see the number of processes by user on the system. And obviously the vast majority are root, but here's that bad actor, Hal, right? Who's got seven processes running on the machine. I cannot emphasize enough how useful this idiom is, how often you want to sort of count things like this. But in general, you know, the power of the Unix shell is knowing all of these little primitives and, and knowing how to snap them together. And that's really a lot of what we were trying to show you in the command line Kung Fu blog. Once you, it's like learning a language, right? You know, once you know the basic grammatical elements, you can put them together in all sorts of fun and entertaining ways. Okay, cool. Let me go back to the original data though, okay? So I've got, you know, on each line, I've got, at the beginning of the line, I've got the source, and at the end, I've got the user agent string. Now, the user agent strings are problematic for awk because they contain spaces, right? And so awk perceives each one of these separate words in the user agent string as a separate field. Right? So that's, that, that's an issue. And so we need a more flexible way of massaging the output. If I, if I wanna have just the source, along with its matching user agent string. I need to get rid of everything in the middle, right? And for that, there's said, the stream editor, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I wanna basically match everything from these double dashes right after the requester all the way to this double quote here that starts the user agent string. And if you look closely, you'll notice that there's always going to be a double quote from the end of the referrer, and then white space, and then another double quote that begins the user agent string. So I'm going to use that to anchor my pattern to get rid of this data. Okay. So back to, to grep again. So I'm going to grep for plugins from the access log, and then I'm going to pipe that into a sed command, the stream editor. I'm gonna 
match a pattern. And that pattern begins dash space dash. And then there's a bunch of other characters. Dot matches any character. Star means multiple occurrences of any character. And I'm going to anchor the pattern at the other end with double quote space double quote. And I'm going to replace that. S is the substitution operator. I'm going to replace that with nothing. So I'm just going to delete it completely. Okay. And there you go. Now, a wise man once said, when giving a live demo, never say anything more instructive than watch this. Watch this. Okay. So there you go. You've got source and user agent string. Oh, rats. We've got the double quote at the end. Oh, all right. I'll get rid of that too. Substitute a double quote. Oops. Double quote at the end of the line. Dollar matches the end of the line with nothing. So you can just keep stacking up commands. Instead, it's like a little programming language. Boom. There you go. Okay. So there's the double quote gone. Happy now? Good. All right. Cool. And now we can, once again, use our little histogram idiom. I want to see, uh, is, the, is the source always using the same user agent string, or are they using multiple user agent strings? Sort pipe2 unique dash c pipe2 sort minus n. Okay. Actually, mm, I'm not going to sort it at the end, because I want things group together by the source, not by the count, okay? All right, and so for example, you can see, you know, like this this source right here, uh, 17688 address. So it's using uh, some sort of Python script to plink away at my website. So that one looks automated. But then you've got this source right here, 4591, 2536, and it's actually sending me multiple user agent strings. Now, is that because programmatically, whatever's trying these is just throwing in random user agent strings so that it doesn't look like a bot? Or is this maybe like a gateway where there's multiple people behind some sort of address translation or VPN endpoint that are using different actual web browsers? Hmm. Well, let's find out. I'm going to grep for that source from my access log. And let's take a look at the URLs that are being requested. They're looking for robots.txt. They're looking for a bunch of URLs that don't exist on my website, right? So to me, this looks like some sort of automated scanning activity that's merely using multiple different user agent strings to try and throw off the track, right? Because all of the URLs they're looking for look like potential, you know, compromise URLs. And I just wanted to, uh, we got a couple of questions, but I also wanted to jump in. I think this type of deep dive, like when I learned like log parsing, this is the way we always used to parse logs, right? You'd go through, take what you knew, and kind of throw it away and focus on the things you didn't know until you got to something interesting. Right, and always be pivoting, right? That's my, yeah, that's my motto always here. Pivoting. And the same process could be used if you're using an elk stack or a sim to try to go through uh, your like logs and just kind of swim in them and not try to expect the sim to tell you exactly what's going on, but actually look at the raw data. So got a couple of questions I wanted to throw your way real quick. One, awk print n is limited to white space delimiter. No. What is a quick way to modify on the fly, say to something like a semicolon? Right. So yeah, so awk does white space as a delimiter by default, but it has a dash capital F option so that you can use other delimiters. So for example, I want to awk my password file, which is colon delimited, right? And I want to print out the username, which is field one, and the user ID, which is field three. Hey, 
head just gives me the first 10 lines by default. So yeah, so you can specify a delimiter uh, with awk with, with dash capital F. Very cool. Someone else asked, would it be possible for us to get your, your history of this session? So we could share that with the webcast as well, because you have the slides, but the idea of being able to get the command history would be a cool tool. We had a couple of people ask. For yeah, that. no, I'm I'm totally down with that. I'll I'll um, we'll figure out we'll figure out how to how to do that, and and we'll make it available. Okay, and then one request, whenever, and you've been doing this for a bunch of them, but when you get the results, kind of going through the results and uh, uh, kind of explaining what it is you were looking for is something that somebody was asking but I, I see that you're doing that anyway. So okay. I'll shut up now and carry on, sir. Okay, cool. So, so you know, the, the Unix design religion is, is putting things together with pipes, you know, and, and doing these kinds of crazy on the fly shenanigans. And, you know, after that, it's just practice, right? It's, it's, it's learning all the different primitives and, and what they can do for you. You know, I've been doing it for 30 years. Uh, I've been pretty, I'm, I'm pretty good at it by now, but uh, so don't, don't feel bad about, you know, just starting, starting with, you know, C spot run kind of thing in, in Unix. You'll, you'll pick it up as you go along. And the other thing is, you know, like, like John and I were just talking about, like if you're swimming through your logs or you're swimming through any other data, just follow your nose, just keep pivoting around and looking for interesting things, uh, interesting patterns and, and, you know, follow those leads wherever they take you. Uh, you know, sometimes you end up going down a rat hole, but sometimes it's interesting, you know, you, you just don't know until you, until you go there. Okay, so I want to change it up a little bit. Let me actually get back on the slideware a little bit. So the slideware, kind of goes through a bunch of the examples that I showed you live, right? So I want to talk a little bit about environment variables. Everybody's like, oh God, how, come on. Environment variables, really? I mean, isn't that kind of basic? Hmm, yeah, okay, let's have some fun with environment variables. So yes, you know, environment variables can do things like change your search path. I can even change my prompt, right? So. Right, so PS1 is the environment variable. If you set it, it changes your prompt. And I could be good. Or I could be evil. Just depends on your mood. Oops. Yeah, imagine how good I could be if I actually got the quoting right on that one. Go me. All right, there we go. But there's all kinds of really fun stuff that you can do with uh, environment variables in Unix. One of the ones that I actually really like for my forensic practice is there's an environment variable called TZ time zone, which sets your local time zone for this shell. So for example, right now, I'm in Florida, US East, East Coast, so I'm in Eastern Standard Time. Right. And if I do, you know, like a listing of a file, like, uh, I don't know, Etsy resolve.com, right. You know, I'm, I'm seeing the last modified time in Eastern time, but maybe that time zone is inconvenient for my investigation. So I can pick any time zone I would like. So for example, if I wanted to be in UTC, the one true time zone, I just set that environment variable. And now when I run the date command or I run any other command that's showing me a timestamp, it shows me that timestamp relative to the time zone that I've chosen. It, it, just as a side note, I wanted to point out that in Unix, Linux systems anyway, time zone files are stored in a directory called user share zone info. And, and the time zone names that you set in the time zone environment variable are basically just file paths that are relative to the top of that directory, right? So you can see there's UTC time right here, but there's also, for example, like the Europe subdirectory, which contains 
you know, different cities. So for example, I could say export TZ equal to Greece, or sorry, Europe, Athens, right? And now I'm in uh, Eastern European time, uh, you know, which is the time zone that, that the city Athens is in. So that can be a convenient way. If you don't happen to know what the time zone is, you can do it by, by geographic location, just by browsing around in, in user share zone info. So anyway, um, and when you, when, by the way, I want to switch back to my home time zone, you can just unset the environment variable. And here I am back in US Eastern time again. So that's a fun one, but still, okay, how, you know, your prompt says you're evil, but you're just showing me stuff that a, a blue team type analyst would do. What can we do that's evil with environment variables, Hal? Well, let's talk about SSH agent. Now, those of you who use Linux and Unix a lot or Macs probably are familiar with SSH agent. It's the program that runs in the background that stores your private keys that you use to log into other systems. And your SSH clients communicate with that SSH agent process running in the background using a Unix socket. And the file path to that Unix socket is stored in an environment variable. And that environment variable is called SSH auth sock. Okay, and so there is the path to my SSH auth sock here in my, my shell. Once I have keys loaded into that, it becomes this sort of frictionless way for me to log into remote systems without having to type my passphrase over and over again. And, and it's hugely useful. And if you're not using SSH agent, oh, you're missing out on, on a huge productivity increase. The problem is that, okay, now your private key is sitting in memory, in the memory of this SSH agent process. And, you know, potentially it could be scraped out of memory by somebody nefarious who's, who's broken root on the system. And, and the attacks on SSH agent keys in, in memory are well documented. And in, in the course slides, I give you a pointer to a, a, a blog that talks about how to attack SSH keys in memory. But there's actually an easier exploit that you can use to pivot off of systems where SSH agent is in use. And, and it's a, a pivot that even works on systems where an SSH agent isn't running, but a user is using agent forwarding to forward a connection to a remote SSH agent on, an, on an, their primary desktop, for example. Okay. So, but to do any of these exploits against SSH agent, I need to be root. So first I need to break root on the box. And I am so leet that if you give me the root password, I can be root in no time at all. Okay. Okay, so now I'm root. Here, let me. to give myself the traditional root prompt. Okay, there I am, right? Okay, so I am root on this system. All right, now because I'm root, I can read any file, I can see everything on the system. So in particular, I wanna find out the SSH auth sock for different users, because I wanna basically hijack their SSH agent connection. And for that, I'm gonna show you another one of my favorite Unix command line tools. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look and see if there are any SSH agent processes running on the system. Nope, okay, so nobody's running SSH agent on the system. How about agent forwarding though? Okay, now if agent forwarding is active, it means that the SSH auth sock is actually being managed by the user's SSH daemon process, the daemon that's running their particular session. So I wanna know about Unix sockets 
that are owned by SSH daemon processes. And this is where it gets fun. Okay, so I want Unix sockets that are also associated with SSH daemons. I love LSOF. LSOF is, is easily my favorite Unix command. It stands for list open files. And everything in Unix is a file, right? So files are files and directories are files, but sockets are also treated like files. And so using LSOF, you can get information about open network connections, open files, and so on. And LSOF violates the Unix design principles. It combines the output of multiple tools into one Uber tool. And so here I'm asking for things that are Unix sockets and which are owned by commands named SSHD. And so you can see that for user Hal, there's my SSH agent path, okay? Cool, all right. Now, what about environment variables, Hal? Well, okay, so now I'm root. I can read from that same socket just like the user can. So I'm going to export SSH auth sock, and I'm gonna set it to the user's SSH auth sock. So now I can impersonate that user and I can use SSH add to list the keys that are present in that SSH agent process that I'm talking to. So this allows me to confirm that there are actually keys stored in that SSH agent that I can use. So where can I go, right? Well, don't really know. But remember that in the user's home directory, there is the known host file, which stores the public keys of systems that the user has connected to from this machine. Hey, remember awk? Okay, so the tilde means home directory of user Hal, in the .ssh subdirectory, I wanna look at the known host file and I wanna print out the first field, which is the host names or the IP addresses of the machines that the user's been visiting. Okay, so if they regularly visit those machines from this host and they're using agent forwarding on this host, then chances are that agent is going to allow you to connect into one of these systems. Now I have to do it as user Hal, right? Ah, it's a beautiful thing, right? I've just logged into another system as user Hal. Now breaking root from here is up to you, right? Okay, so, so this is the great SSH agent pivot, right? Like I didn't have to scrape a key out of memory or do anything tricky like that. I just had to talk to the same SSH agent process that the user was using. It's kind of the, the Unix equivalent of a pass the hash attack, right? I mean, I'm leveraging their agent to log in as them other places on the network. And in fact, if I actually log in as them using the dash capital A option, which is the agent forwarding option. Then I still have access to that same SSH agent process and I can keep pivoting off of this system, still leveraging that SSH agent process that I pivoted off of from the previous system. And that's a beautiful thing. Because in general, like people who like to use SSH agent like to use the same keys in lots of different places. And you can go pretty far with this technique. 
it's a beautiful thing. And it, this is one of the things that we talk about in my uh, securing Linux class with SANS, right? SSH agent is hugely convenient, but there's always this trade-off between convenience and security. And you're seeing the, the rough end of that stick here. Okay, so that's cool, right? A little bit of uh, SSH hacking with environment variables. Now, the thing is, you know, talking about history, right? Your history is going to give you away, right? I'm, I'm doing all these nefarious things, and you can clearly see, you know, in my history, this pattern of evil that I've done to, um, to do this, right? Okay, so I need to to make that go away. And you know, bash history anti forensics is is a topic of much debate, right? But let me show you my favorite commands for sort of making your history not be a problem for you. There's a couple of environment variables that you need to know about. So the one is export hist size equal to zero. Okay. And that nukes your history and memory. And it also means that you won't be accumulating any history from this point forward. Now, you can't see my history anymore if I run the history command. If I take a memory dump of this system and I do some string searching, I will probably be able to find remnants of that history floating around in memory for some period of time. But, it won't be easily extractable with something like, you know, Volatility's Linux Bash plugin. Okay, so that nukes my history right now. But the problem is, if I exit this shell, it's going to truncate the Bash history file on disk to zero bytes, and that's going to, you know, tell people, oh, something hinky's been going on. People have been blowing away Bash history. So the other variable I wanted to introduce you to was export hist file equals dev null. Okay, so this changes where the shell is going to write its history. And because I've set it to dev null, when I exit this shell, it's not going to impact the current history file on disk, right? So the dev null is just the bit bucket, everything that goes in there goes away. So, so this combination of environment variables is sort of my preferred method for yeah. hiding what I'm doing. Someone, someone just brought up a point that said you were supposed to share your command history with us. Is what you just did going to wipe out the entire command history of everything that you did as part of this webcast? Uh, in this root shell, but I can certainly recreate it for you, right? Yeah. I mean, I know, I know the, uh, I know the examples I did. So um, yes, you'd just, be surprised how quickly people were like, "No, no." <laughs> I think I think Hal can recreate it. It'll be okay. I, I can rebuild it. We're we're okay. Don't sweat it. We're 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 all good here. So yeah. So I did a little presentation for the the forensic summit called "You Don't Know Jack About Bash History," and if you're interested in um, taking a look at that presentation. It's actually it was recorded and it's online and you can get the slides from my website. It's a lot of more about bash history forensics and anti-forensics there. Okay, but let's suppose you screwed up, right? Let's suppose you, instead of like nuking your history in this way, you actually did like an RM on, you know, root bash history, right? The, the problem with RM, is that while it unlinks the file from the file system, the content of the file is still floating around in blocks that are now in the unallocated collection, right? The original content of the file is not overwritten, it's merely marked as unallocated. But until something overwrites those blocks, I can recover them, right? I mean, this is a lot of what we do in forensics, recovering deleted data, that was you know, removed by attackers. So built into Unix, there is a secure delete command called shred. So shred overwrites the file content with random data before removing the file, right? So shred-u means 
overwrite and then unlink the file. It's like the secure delete version of RM. And if people use shred to delete their files, eh, it makes my life, well, pretty, pretty damn difficult. Small caveat, portions of the file may be available in the journal, the file system journal, for a short period of time after these kinds of file operations. But in general, once somebody shreds a file, they're, it's pretty much gone. Okay. All right, but what, what happens if I screwed up? Like, what happens if, if I stupidly just removed bash history, right? Boom. It's, I, I made it go away from the file system, but I know the, the content is still floating around and unallocated. Believe me, it's very easy for me to find deleted bash history and unallocated, right? Because there's, there's patterns like RM, you know, and then a file path like RM slash something or CD slash something, you know, that make it easy to locate shell commands floating around and unallocated. So I gotta, I gotta somehow overwrite that data that I've accidentally put into unallocated that I don't want people to see, okay? And so here's a cute trick for that. All right, so I wanna make sure that I'm in the, the, the file system, right? So slash root is, is here in this volume, okay? So I wanna blow away, overwrite all of the unallocated blocks in this file system where I deleted roots bash history. DD, my input file is gonna be dev u random. My output file is just gonna be a file named junk. To make this go faster, I'm gonna set the block size to one megabyte, right? And when the DD command fills up the disk, it's gonna exit. And when it exits, I'm gonna remove the file called junk that I just created. So what's gonna happen here? The DD command is gonna make a giant file that eats up all of the remaining available disk space full of random data. And then when the disk is filled up, the DD command exits and I just delete the big file that I created, freeing up all that space. But the net effect is that I've wiped all of the unallocated and just filled it up with random data. Now this is going to take a while, right? And I'll just let that go. But anyway, that's the last example I wanted to do anyway. So we can just let that go in the background. So, and actually let me show you while we're here, built into the bash shell, there is a benchmarking primitive, oops. So I can take the same command line and do time at the front of it. And whenever this finishes, it'll show me exactly how much time this command took. All right. So I'm gonna let that go in the background. We'll check back in on it in a few minutes when it's had a chance to fill up the file system. Again, the slides have a lot of information that I showed you already. But, you know, I could do this all day, right? There's so many cool command line tricks that I haven't had a chance to show you in this one hour webcast. And, and you know, based on the number of people who signed up for this sucker, we were curious if, you know, if we put together a one or two day command line uh, skills class, would people be willing to pay money for that? So, you know, like maybe 200 bucks for a one day online class, something like that. So anyway, if you'd be interested in a longer training session, possibly where you had to pay for it, please drop CL Dojo into the chat just so we can sort of get a feel for how many people would be interested. Also, if you have specific topics that you are just dying to learn, that would help me put the class together. So uh, feel free to drop those into the chat as well. So yeah, if you could put in the CL Dojo if you're interested right now. And then also there was a ton of questions and how we've got the full accounting of all the questions that they asked. Uh, we tried to do our best to keep up and we were doing fine right up to the point of the CL Dojo thing. 
happened. <laughs> and now I'm, I'm giving up. I've got some questions at the top for people that I would like to kind of run through in the last 10 minutes, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. That's why I left some time here. All right. Awesome. The first one that came up, and I, I, I'm going to blame Malware Jake for this, but somebody put in, I would love to hear Hal's take on System D. You know, yeah, and if you read Jake's Twitter feed, he is he is utterly bagging on System D. And I, I have to say that you cannot count me in the System D haters camp. And this is, you know, this is 30 plus years of Unix talking. Um, I actually think that System D is good because the the engineers at Red Hat who who developed System D actually understood the problem space and what was wrong with existing Unix booters. So System D has some things in it that are really worthwhile. The the whole architecture around dependency trees for applications stacks is only becoming more important as our application stacks become more and more complicated, right? So you've got, you know, Kubernetes orchestrating a bunch of Docker containers and inside the Docker containers, there's like a three-tier web app with a database and some middleware and a web server. And the cool thing about systemd, which is also true of, of other things like, you know, upstart for Ubuntu and things like that, is you can define a dependency graph so that if something breaks lower in the stack, it gracefully shuts down you know, all of the other layers of the stack and then brings them back up automatically when you fix the problem at the lower layer. And that makes that a lot easier. The other thing is that you know, System D has features like start on demand services. So you can have System D bind to a port and then it can when the service is requested for the first time, start that service. And that's important because if you think about the way Unix systems are deployed right now, they're in multi-tenant environments where you have thousands of virtual instances running on a big hypervisor. Now, if I have to reboot that hypervisor and restart all of those virtual instances, and they have to restart all of their services all effectively the same time, that's a huge load on the hypervisor. Start on demand lets me spread out that load and only start the services as necessary. And so it makes sense for the way we deploy Linux systems these days. Now, from an administration perspective, systemd is also a good thing. Here, we're gonna put this in the background. And because I can do things like system control, status, SSHD. Right. And I see like not only, hey, look, SSHD is running, I get to see all the logs. Right. So like those of you who've been doing Unix, Unix admin for a long time know the way this happened in the bad old days. Right. If SSHD went away, you had to go into var log and grep through the log files until you remember which log it was that actually got the errors from SSHD. Right. And it was a big pain in the butt. So with this, I can in, like we're one stop shop get the status of the service and all of the logs associated with it. And the fact that every all the Linux distros now are going to systemd means that there's now one single command line interface for managing system services. It's not like the old days where Red Hat had check config and Debian, you know, you were still using scripts and et cetera, init.d and, you know, Ubuntu had upstart and all this stuff, right? There's homogeneity and if you're somebody who jumps around between linux platforms that is a huge time saver so actually count me in the system d is good camp and you know jake and i can have a have a cage match about this later on but i'm right and he's wrong and there's there's a lot of people i think that whenever they look at system d you know that change happened and then commands like if config switched over to ipa and things like that and i think I think it's a mistake to try to lump all of those changes together and say that that's system D because it's really not. And I'm not saying that's what Jake does, but I've been with people like, <clears throat> oh, I hate system D. It got rid of IF config. And I'm like, that's no, not it what you that, think. That change was happening that's, long before system D. That, 
That's uh, not, no, they're different things. I just think that for some distributions, they hit at the same time in the default installation, and they think that they were all kind of together. Another one, uh, does the SSH agent only work if they're actively logged into the system? Yeah, so generally SSH agent starts when the user starts their windowing environment. So typically there's an SSH agent process running for the user who's logged in on the console. You know, and then, but the caveat is what I just showed you in the example in this webcast, right? People who are doing agent forwarding, you know, like in my case, I was doing agent forwarding from my Mac operating system into this Linux virtual machine, right? So the SSH agent process is actually running on my Mac, but I'm accessing it over the forwarded agent connection. Very cool. Brandon asks, is there an alternative for LSOF? It's no longer installed by default on his Red Hat Enterprise Linux servers, which I thought LSOF was still installed by default, but. Yeah, well, shame on Red Hat. I mean, cause it's only the single most un useful Unix admin command in the world, but okay. I mean, no, but there's yum install LSOF. Yeah, it takes just a second. Yeah, so now you mentioned a talk you went over it very quickly. It was something like you don't know anything about... You don't know uh, Jack about Bash history. Is that online somewhere that people could pull that down? Yeah. Or the so, slides? So I, in, the, in the slides for this talk, I actually gave the URL for that talk. Also, if you okay. go to YouTube, they recorded me giving that presentation at DFIR Summit. You can actually see me giving a kind of high-speed version of that talk in a 30 minute slot at DFIR Summit. Oh, I think I've actually seen that. It is the entire talk in 30 minutes. Uh, it was pretty cool. Do, 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 do. Will there be an SS agent, SSH agent left in a screen or a TMUX session if the user started from a Windows session as well? So yeah, if they, if they logged into the Unix machine with agent forwarding, and then started screen and left it running, then that agent connection will persist. Oh, no, it won't. No, you know it won't because the minute they exit the SSH connection that's connecting to that machine, it breaks the agent forwarding, right? Because the, the agent forwarding is carried over that SSH login session. So as soon as the SSH login session goes away, so does the agent forwarding. Now, the SSH offsock variable will still be set in that user's shell, but there won't be any way to talk to the SSH agent process. Okay. My DD command just finished, so there we go. Very cool. And a bunch of people found the, uh, found the YouTube link, and we've got that out to everybody. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, was you surprised. Can, you, can, you can pop my name into Google, and you'll find a number of different Linux-related presentations. There's one just about... SE Linux and you know stuff like that. Just Google me; it'll it'll show up. Yeah, I wasn't. Yeah. Try, I was trying not to be that guy. Oh, it was go. I was gonna pull you into it though. I was gonna pull you into it. I also love it when people type in, "Did it just crash for everyone or just me?" It's probably just you. So here's the deal: everything blew up with the CL Dojo. Or so we're gonna get this cut. We're gonna get it online for everybody. And we'll let you know sometime in later on in the year, and we will absolutely be doing more with Hal. So thank you so much for coming on, Hal. I really well, appreciate it, and I hope you had a good time. And I'm going to throw this last one in. By the way, I have a question. I usually don't do this with people's desktops, but I'm going to do it with you. So you've got block dir header and entries, block dir tail hashes, block dir tail posts, delete. What do you What do you have there, or can you not talk about it? No, actually, so those of you who've been following stuff I've been doing, over on my Righteous IT blog, I was doing a bunch of articles about XFS internals, and I sort of got interrupted by casework in the middle of that. But those are screen captures of Synalyzit grammars for, for different internal XFS data structures that are going to become part of that series of of presentations. You know, I'm the guy who likes to look at file system data structures in a hex editor. That's just kind of my thing. 
so so that's what what that stuff is cool all right Hal. any final words before we kill the recording hey linux is awesome get you some linux